Hallo und herzlich willkommen zum Bücherbewältigung. Bücherbewältigung, or coming to terms with books, is what I'm going to call me reading a short story and talking about it. So yeah, today I'm reading Tango by Kurt Vonnegut, one of my all-time favorite authors. It starts with, Every job application form I fill out asks for a tabulation, with dates, of what I've done with my adult life so far, and tells me sternly to leave no periods unaccounted for. I would give a great deal for permission to leave out the last three months, when I served as a tutor in a village called Ponet. Anyone writing my former employer there for an appraisal of my character would get his ears burnt off. On each application form there's a small blank section entitled Remarks, where I might tell my side of the Ponet story. But it seems there's little chance of anyone's understanding my side if he hasn't seen Ponet, and the chances of an ordinary man seeing Ponet are about the same as the chance of being dealt two spade royal flushes in a row. That's going to be the framing device for how the story is set up. It's basically a guy lamenting something that happened because it's going to screw up his employment chances. Our main character narrator says that I worked there as a tutor for Robert Brewer, an amiable, mildly fog-bound young man who was preparing to take college entrance examinations and needed help. And then Kurt Vonnegut sets up what, what the tango is and what sort of the significance it's going to have. By saying, the tango, of course, is a dance of Spanish-American origin, usually in 4-4 time, and is distinguished by the low dips and twisting steps on the toes. One Saturday night, at the weekly dance of the Ponet Yacht Club, young Robert Brewer, my student, who had never even seen the tango performed in his 18 years of life, began to dip lowly and twist his toes. His movements were tentative at first, as involuntary as shudders. Robert's mind and face were blank when it happened. The heady Latin music wandered through his ears, found nobody at home under his crew cut, into command of his long, thin body. Something clicked, locking Robert in the machinery of the music. His partner, a plain, wholesome girl with three million dollars and a low center of gravity, struggled in embarrassment and then, seeing the fierce look in Robert's eyes, succumbed. The two became one, a fast-moving one. Dancing in upon it was an almost imperceptible shifting of weight from one foot to the other with the feet remaining in one place from three to six inches apart. This seemly shifting of weight was all things to all music. Samba, waltz, foxtrot. No matter what new dance craze came along, upon it overpowered it easily. The ballroom could have been filled with clear gelatin to shoulder height without hampering the dancers. It could have been filled to a point just below the dancers' nostrils, for that matter, for agreement on every subject was so complete that discussion had been reduced to a verbal shorthand resembling asthma. So Robert dances with this girl in a place where no one dances and everyone is incredibly stuffy, so to speak. And as soon as it's done, as soon as he finishes dancing, his partner kind of gets embarrassed and runs away. And his father pulls him aside and basically tells him how much of an embarrassment he is. And actually uses the phrase, uh, this isn't Coney Island and it isn't going to become Coney Island. Now go apologize to your mother. And I think that's just a weird, it was probably just a weird thing of the times. But I just enjoy that admonishment. So basically, now Robert is feeling incredibly kind of broken up about this, and he goes and talks to the tutor. Robert says to the tutor, I don't mean to be impolite, but you couldn't possibly understand. And the tutor replies, well, I've been around long enough to see the sort of thing they get exercised about around here. And Robert says, it's, it's so easy for you to make comments. It's easy to make fun of anything if you don't have any responsibilities. And the tutor says, responsibilities? You've got responsibilities for what? And Robert looked about himself moodily. This... All this. Someday I'll be taking this over, presumably. You? You're as free as the air, to come and go as you please, and laugh all you like. And the tutor says, Robert, it's just real estate. If it depresses you, why, when you take over, just sell it. And Robert was shocked. Sell it. My grandfather built this place. And the tutor says, he's a fine bricklayer. And Robert replies, it's a way of life that's rapidly disappearing all over the world. Farewell. If Pinot goes under, then if we all abandon ship, who's going to preserve the old values? What old values? Being grim about tennis and sailing? Civilization. Leadership. What civilization? That book your mother keeps saying she's going to read someday if it kills her? And who around here leads anything anywhere? And it's at that point that Robert gets all sorts of frustrated, and the tutor, instead of continuing to engage with that, just gets up and puts on a tango record. And they sit listening to the tango record for a little bit. And then the maid from upstairs comes down and says that she thought she heard voices. They get into this habit of every night the tutor puts on the record, the maid comes from upstairs, and the tutor and the maid dance, and then Robert takes over. In three weeks' time, Robert was an excellent dancer and hopelessly in love with Marie. 
How did it happen? He said to me. How could it? You're a man and she's a woman, I said. We're utterly different, he said. Viva la utter difference, I said. What'll I do? What'll I do? He said heartbrokenly. Proclaim your love, I said. For a maid, he said incredulously. And basically, to confront this, at this point, the tutor has fallen in love with the maid, the maid has fallen in love with the tutor, and Robert has also fallen in love with the maid. So it's this weird, uncomfortable love triangle. And the tutor kind of tries to bring things to a head. So he goes and talks to the maid about life and love and whether or not she loves Robert or him. And she just kind of brushes it off. The tutor ends up forcing her to say, no, I... I love you, Mr. Tudor Man, who I don't think has a name. And he's like, okay, well, we gotta, we gotta sort Robert out, I guess. So basically, the tutor hatches this plan to force Robert to try to make an action one way or another. And he says, well, <laughs> if you really love Marie, then take her to the dance. Take her to one of the balls that all these rich people in this neighborhood have. And he's like, I can't, I can't do it. And it sucks so much. And I'm actually going to read a bit from that scene. Robert was stung speechless. Man or mouse, I said, bringing the issue back into focus. Robert chewed his lip and at last murmured something we couldn't understand. What was that? said Marie. Mouse, Robert said with a sigh. I said mouse. Mouse, said Marie softly. Well, don't say it that way, said Robert desolately. What other way is there to say mouse, said Marie. Good night. I followed her out into the hall. Well, I said, it's been rough on him, but... Marie, said Robert, appearing in the doorway... You wouldn't like it. You'd hate it. You'd have a terrible time. Everybody has a terrible time. That's why I said mouse. As long as there's music, said Marie, and the gentleman is proud of his lady, nothing else matters. Ah, uh, said Robert. He disappeared into the sitting room again, and we heard the couch springs creak. You were saying, said Marie? I was saying it was a rough thing to put him through, but it'll do him a world of good in the long run. This will eat at him for years, and there's a good chance he'll become the first rounded human being in Panat history. A long, slow, profound double-take. Listen, said Marie, he's talking to himself. What is he saying? Mouse, 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 said Robert. Mouse, mouse. We've lit the fuse, I whispered, on a spiritual time bomb. Mouse, man, mouse, man, said Robert. A couple of years from now, I said, kaboom. Man, shouted Robert. Man, man, man. He was on his feet, charging out into the hall. Man, he said savagely, and he bent Marie over backwards, kissing her hotly. He straightened her up and pulled her after him down the stairs to the second floor. I followed them down, appalled, because at this point the, the tutor's like, Aw, oh, shit, shit, my plan's backfired. He's actually gonna stand up. He's gonna be a real man. My kind of shitty plan to force him into a corner failed. So they go down and they dance. And there's this huge thing. Robert has found himself, basically. But Marie still doesn't love him. But it, it's kind of okay because, like, he's he knows that he's allowed to exist as a human being. He doesn't need he doesn't need all these traditions and all this weight that's been placed on him. And I want to read the last little paragraph here. It it frames the story and it works really well. Robert's reply to his father's question, I realize with each application form I fill out, was unnecessarily heroic. Had we left it unsaid, Mister Brewer's attitude toward me might have softened in time. But now, when I write his name down as my last employer, I smear it with the ball of my thumb, hoping that prospective employers will take my honest smile as reference enough. It means, sir, said Robert, that you should thank my two friends here for raising your son from the dead. And oh my god, I absolutely love that. I adore that because, because honestly, tradition doesn't mean much. It's if it brings meaning and joy to your family or group or whatever. If it gives some meaning, then it's, it serves a purpose. But if it's there just to hold you down, then screw it. You don't you don't need that. If a tradition is there only to be a weight on your shoulders, then I, I say you should just abandon it. At least that's how I feel. Well, anyway, thank you for sticking along this far, and I hope you enjoyed me reading books. <laughs>